Stefan. Hi, Stefan. It's great to see you. <laughs> nice, nice to see you. Again. Did you have a good trip? Yes, very good. Very good. So no, glad you're good. here. Are you sure that everything happened? Yeah, it was uh, when we woke up in the middle of the night, the object was out over the lake between this tree and this tree. What kind of object was it? Well, I saw a large egg-shaped ellipse with a big light coming out of it. So and from my view from the house, I didn't see the ellipse, the elliptical shape so much, but I saw this huge beam of light coming out 20, 30 feet high. Yeah. Michael had known for many years that he was an experiencer, while Trish had never heard of this phenomenon. That night, Michael found himself sitting on the foot of the bed with his eyes wide open, watching an extremely bright object outside hovering over the lake. Shortly afterwards, Trish found herself at exactly the same place while Michael had gone into the kitchen to observe the object. Neither of them have any recollection of what happened from the moment they went to bed to the moment they found themselves sitting on the foot of the bed. They both wanted to explore this mental blank individually through light hypnosis sessions with John Mack. These sessions would help them to remember the entire experience, and it turned out that their respective versions were virtually identical. Seeing the UFO was not the whole experience. It was only the end of a much longer experience. And so what we discovered was that between the time we went to sleep and the time we woke up, that, that we'd actually had an encounter. I recalled uh, suddenly being higher than the bed. I, I was lying on the bed on my back, and my feet were, um, I could see my feet turning up a little like your feet would if you're lying down, the toes are up higher. And I could see them, and I, I was lying down, and I could feel that I was maybe a foot above the bed. And I was really interested in that. <laughs> I thought, wow. And, but I could just feel it, and then my body started to move, um, and it turned slightly, and it, it went toward the wall, and I just kept moving, and soon I was moving through the wall. And I would think that that would be basically crazy, but that's what was happening. And uh, somehow I was moved into this uh, light tunnel. I don't know, because I can't see where I was or if anyone was with me, but I was kind of like tilted back. You know, I don't really know how to explain it, but if I'm up straight, I was kind of like tilted back. And then I thought I saw some beings, but I couldn't get a clear image. It was like if you had a, a camera and you kept turning the lens and putting the person in and out of focus. I couldn't really focus on them, so there'd be kind of a shape of like five shoulders and heads looking at me. And then I was moved to another place, and there was kind of like a big light shining on me with some sh silhouettes of people or beings. And then I was brought to another place. I didn't have really a lot of clear images. And then suddenly I was uh, going backwards through the tunnel that I had just gone forwards through. And I could recognize the sequence of the colors. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I was going back through the very same thing that I'd gone through. And then suddenly there was just blinding light and I was uh, sitting on the edge of the bed. There was uh, a being with me um, and, and I was seated in a chair, and I was just moving down the tunnel. Uh, it, something was drawing me down. And this being was with me, and I, I was completely feeling love. I felt very comfortable and very secure. I felt surrounded by love. It was amazing. I just couldn't... I can't even explain it too well right now. I just felt so uh, safe. And uh, then I was, um, the next thing I knew, well, this being was made of light, <laughs> which I had never seen a being of light before. But I could see the eyes were brighter, and then the rest of the, there was not a definition of a body. It was just light. And, um, but it was very loving and friendly. And then the next thing I knew, I was sitting on the end of the bed, looking out the window at this uh, tunnel of light. 
which is across the lake. I couldn't tell if it was disappearing or if it was being retracted back into the big ellipse, but it was either it was being pulled in or it was disappearing. And then for one moment, there was no extension. There was just the big egg-shaped object. And then it was gone. And it vanished, it vanished right before my eyes. Even more surprising is that the night before their experience, Michael, a romantic at heart, captured their evening on film so that if he and Trish were still together the following year, they could watch the tape. For no particular reason, he went to film outside. As planned, they watched the tape one year later, only to find that an unexplained object had been recorded. This is the uh, cabin that we stayed in when we had the encounter. That's the bedroom, that's the living room. Now I'm outside the cabin looking back in. There's me in the camcorder. But look, here's a light and a light, and I'm zoomed right in on it. And yet, and there's another one down here, and I, I really wasn't aware of them. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And the silent. See, it's completely silent. But now some geese come in. So you see that the camcorder is working. So what were those silent lights? And how did they just vanish? And the most amazing thing is that you, you don't remember that you filmed that. I don't remember I filmed it. And see, now I'm back just making the dinner as if it never happened. And I didn't see the pictures for a year because we were still dating a year later and I took the video out. And that's when I saw the lights. <laughs> what was on this videotape, an object? I certainly realized that the emotions experienced by the abductees I had talked to were what really impressed me the most. Michael, Trish, Randy, Will, and Karen are all mentally stable people. For John, too, the individual testimonies were the most convincing evidence. As a psychiatrist, an expert in the workings of the mind, John had become certain that, as well as being sane, the abductees were telling the truth. The way science works, you get a, a pattern emerges, you know, which has a certain robustness. Uh, not everyone's the same. Some are more traumatized, some are more spiritually open, some are more involved with ecology, and some have more apocalyptic kind of images. And in this particular culture, this is not supposed to happen. So what? What's possible is a, is a matter of worldview. Uh, you, you, it's arbitrary. Uh, a culture decides what's real. What's real in this culture is completely different what's, than what's true in American Indian reality or uh, Tibetan Buddhist reality or uh, uh, Hawaiian kahuna reality or whatever. You know, we have one set of ideas of what's real, which is a very limited one. It's become more and more limited as the centuries have gone on. So that, as uh, poet Rilke said, the when he, in talking about the spirit world, the senses by the senses by which we can know the spirit world have atrophied. In other words, we don't even have the uh, the apparatus in our perceptual capability of knowing much more of reality. We've it's like we, we we've lost the the very senses to, to know beyond this limited physical horizon. Why do we so desperately want to believe that all this is impossible? This, however, is not the question that these abductees pose. They don't ask me to believe them, nor do they try to convince me. Is it what we call rationality that makes us reject what they have to say? Spending time with John made me realize that we don't have enough information to decide what is or is not possible, as too many things remain beyond our grasp. So I decided to listen, to continue my research, and to explore this new frontier. And this brought me to Sue and David's picturesque home in Vermont. Sue's 56. She's experienced abduction since childhood. They've been very traumatic experiences for her. In the course of time, she's managed to overcome her fear, among other things, by painting her visitors. It was so scary to me when I think about it, but then when I finally could, was able to paint it, 
then it didn't seem so scary to me. His face doesn't look that scary. He almost looks like he has a, a look of wonderment. But you remember precisely having seen this, yeah. this face? When, when was it? The first abduction Sue remembers clearly well, occurred when she was 19. A pulsating blue light woke her as it made its way across the bedroom. Sue was in bed, terrified and unable to look at it. They're here, she thought. But who are they? Her thoughts made no sense at all. She heard her mother get up, call her, and then go back to bed. Terrified, Sue found the courage to